بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, it is a great pleasure and honor today to have all this gathering I'm really proud uh, by this meeting and by the uh, professors and the colleagues uh, Professor Anna Hav, the president of SNT Professor Maya Hasaballah, president elect of SNT uh, Professor Ayman Rifai, secretary general of SNT uh, all professors and colleagues by uh, on behalf of all of you I would like to welcome uh, their guest. He is not guest. Uh, he is one of uh, the most beloved uh, professors and doctors. He is Egyptian, and uh, we are proud that he finds his way to the United Kingdom, working as consultant of nephrology. And today, I'm very happy to hear from him uh, about COVID-19 and the role of antivirals and highlights on the ongoing studies. Professor Mohsen al Qusi. Fadl. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hussain, for this introduction. And it is my pleasure and my honor as well to take part in this discussion. Uh, sorry, the computer is just playing up a bit. <laughs> no problem. Uh, now it's okay. That's okay. Fine. It's okay. Uh, thank you. Giving me, uh, first of all, uh, Ramadan Kareem, وكل سنة وحضراتكم جميعا طيبين وربنا يعيدوا علينا وعليكم بالخير ويا رب يعني في بع في خلال رمضان تكون الغمة دي إن شاء الله علينا جميعا يا رب. يا رب. أمين يا رب. أمين يا رب. يا رب. Uh, it's my pleasure to just give me this opportunity to reflect on what I have read within the last three weeks uh, and to share my thoughts. Uh, clearly, I have to highlight here, I am not uh, a virologist and I am not an ID consultant, I am a nephrologist. And as we are all of us aware that, oh, I mean, we are now participating in a way or the other in this crisis. This is an awful disease. As a nephrologist, we are involved in the ITU patients for the CVVH, around 30% for those who are intubated they require CVVH with this COVID-19. We are dealing with the, our hemodialysis patients who have got to have high mortality around maybe 15 to 20% in our cohort uh, of death from the coronavirus. So I hope that we will share these thoughts and we will come up with something to see what is going on in this uh, awful disease. I will start with this, I mean, with this slide. If you are aware, I mean, that the coronavirus was discovered in 1960s. And uh, of interest, the lady who has, I mean, photographed the first coronavirus by the, micros uh, the electron microscopy, her paper was rejected because they claimed that, oh, this is not, nothing new. It is an old virus, but you have just, I mean, the, the pictures are dirty. And uh, seven years later, in 1960s, it's been published and realized that there is, I mean, a human coronavirus. From the 1960s until 2002, 2003, there was no much interest of the coronavirus at all in human being, simply because it causes just a very mild upper respiratory tract infection. Until the SARS, the severe adult respiratory syndrome has happened in Wandong in China in 2002, and around 8,000 patients being involved with a mortality rate of around 10%, uh, varies between eight up to 12%. And it was realized at this time from 2002, 2003, with this SARS-CoV, that the causative agent is coronavirus coming from the bats and the animal reservoir is the civet ball cats. The, I mean, recognize it. But for unclear reason, nobody has progressed further to find a drug or a treatment or a vaccine for this awful uh, virus. Up until 2012, when it has happened again in Saudi Arabia and the Arabian Peninsula, when 2,500 has been affected with the virus by a similar virus, obviously not the same virus, called the MERS, which is the Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome. And uh, the animal reservoir was discovered to be the, ca the camel, and the mortality rate was around 35%. Again, 
Nobody has made anything following this uh, epidemic has happened in the Middle East. And uh, everything set quiet, silent, up until the current crisis. There was a gap in 2016 when the Chinese has got around 25,000 deaths in the pigs in 2016. And they didn't give that much information about this catastrophe in the pig cultivation. Then in 2019, we realized now another virus similar to the SARS-CoV called the SARS-CoV-2 has got uh, some similarities and some differences from the SARS-CoV, which is 2002, and the MERS of the 2012. The similarities are that the genetic sequencing between both of them around maybe 76% to the SARS-CoV and around 50% to the MERS. And that's why we will see now that maybe most of the drugs that might work on SARS might not, uh, sorry, that might work on SARS might work in SARS-CoV-2, which is the COVID-19. But those who are working on the MERS might not work that much with the COVID-19 because of the dissimilarity. The other similarity is the SARS-CoV of the 2002 and the 2019, they both use the same receptor in the uh, human, which is the angiotensin converting enzyme to receptor. And they are using the spike from their end to the receptor in the human being. The MERS, they are using a different receptor, the PPD4, which is completely different. The other difference, the COVID-19, the mortality rate is slightly less. Although we don't have a, I mean, a clear idea how much is the exact mortality rate, simply because it all varies depending on the rate of testing, whether the, we are testing the, I mean, the asymptomatic cases or whether we are I mean, testing those who are admitted to the hospitals. So it, it varies from an area to the other. So still the mortality rate has not yet settled for the current pandemic. But this is another area of difference compared to the uh, SARS-CoV and the MERS. The other area of difference, there are, as you are aware, and you will know now, that all the RNA viruses have got an issue about the mutation. They mutate very frequently. And two mutations, very important mutations, has happened from the SARS-CoV to SARS-CoV-2. This mutation, one, made it more virulent in the spike protein. And that's why it can attach very virulently to the human being. And it is very contagious. That's why it is 2 million and 2 and a half million. And if you compare it to the other one, which is the SARS-CoV, was around only 8,000. And the other mutation, which is very important and crucial, one of the non-structural proteins of the COVID-19, or the SARS-CoV-2, called the non-structural non protein 14. This has made an exonuclease activity, which inactivates most of the, uh, the drugs that works on the RNA phosphorylase. Okay? Right. For this current pandemic, we don't know so far the intermediate host or the animal reservoir. Some people blame the snakes, but the snakes are not sold in this one uh, market. Some people blame the, the uh, turtles. Uh, they are selling this in the Wuhan uh, market. But the most, I mean, uh, proving evidence is with the uh, uh, pangolin. The, this is the endangered animal because, the, I mean, they are using its scales and meat in the southeast. And they found that definitely some of the pangolins in Malaysia infected with the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, right? What is interesting to me, this article, to be honest, Whilst I was reading, I was surprised with this article. Maybe uh, some of you has seen this article. You can see it has been published in March 2019, and it was submitted for publication 2000, uh, August 2018. And the sponsor was the United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Disease. What did they say, the authors, in this article? Can you see here? Lack of ban coronavirus drugs makes healthcare systems vulnerable for a highly pathogenic pandemic. This is before this pandemic. And what did they say as well? While the next emerging 
coronavirus may be symptomatically or antigenically similar to SARS-CoV or MERS-CoV, the possibility exists that novel highly pathogenic coronavirus may be poised for spillover into human populations with potentially disastrous consequences, which we are in. And this was around maybe a year ago, or maybe just yeah, nearly a year ago. What did they say as well? However, biological factors that increase cross-species transmission from the animal, obviously, to the human, or facilitate person-to-person -person spread may lead to future coronavirus strains not capable of being contained by timely quarantine of infected individuals. Very interesting to me, to be honest. I mean, that they have been predicting that a pandemic is on the way and we will probably will not be able to contain it. Now, I'm sure that all of you are familiar with this structure, uh, with the coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2. It is, I mean, uh, one of the largest single RNA viruses, has got 30 kilobase, two thirds of it for the non-structural proteins from non-structural protein one up to non-structural protein 16, and the uh, 10 kilobases from the 30 for the structural proteins, E for the envelope, and the N for the nucleic capside, which is inside the inner layer of this uh, membrane, and the M for membrane, and the S, which is the very important one, is the spike protein, which in, uh, I mean entangled with the host receptor for vi virulence or viral entrance. What is the difference between this and the previous ones, or the SARS, COV, and the MERS? Around 95% of the COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, which is the current one, similar to the bat uh, coronaviruses. Many bat coronaviruses, genetic structure around 95%. To the SARS-CoV, around 76%. To the MERS, around 50%. And the spike protein in relation to the SARS-CoV, around 78%. What does this mean? This means that most probably the drugs which might work on the SARS-CoV in the past may work as well on the SARS-CoV-2. And this is simply because there is no time to develop a new drug. Because, I mean, you will see in a minute, which is here in this cartoon, you will see two important observations. I'll just go through this cycle quite quickly. This is the coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2, has got the S uh, receptor or what we call the spike protein attached to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor, facilitated by a receptor in the host cell membrane called the TMPR or uh, I mean, uh, uh, phosphate strase receptor, and then just to make the endo, uh, endocytosis and make the, art, the, sorry, the, particle, the viral particle to be fused with the membrane of the host cell, and then start to produce the viral proteins by the host cells, which is the 16 non-structural protein, and a very important protein here, one of the products called the, the uh, three chemotrypsin-like protease, because this is the site of many of the drugs, and then it starts to work the uh, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to do the genetic code of the virus and then to do the structural protein to get the variant outside. One of the important items about this vi virus, we don't know for sure the pathogenicity and the virulence of this virus. Is it coming from the viral replication only or from the immune dysregulation with the cytokine storm? or it's a combination of both, but we don't know the contribution of each to the pathogenicity of the virus or to the host. And that's why you can see the macrophage here and the interleukin-6 and all this immune dysregulation. I've just ignored it for now. But what I have just, I mean, concentrated on, I concentrated on the viral replication process. You can see the drugs that will work here and I would like you to concentrate on three drugs mainly. Drugs that can work on the ligation of the S protein to the AC, uh, ACE2 receptor, which you can see here, two drugs to be honest. One is experimental called Camsostat, is being approved only in Japan for the treatment of pancreatitis and has not been in any trials or experimental evidence so far for the COV-2. 
and the chloroquine on the hydroxychloroquine, they can work on the virus ligation of the receptor to the host receptor. And then the membrane fusion of the virus with the host cell membrane, which is the Arbidol or Yomifinivir. This only approved in China and Russia for the influenza in 2014. And then you can see the Lubinovir and Retinovir, which is the anti-HIV. They will work in the chemotrypsin-like OTAs. And you can see the rest, the ribavirin, remidisivir, favibrivir, which they all work on the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. The three drugs I would like you to concentrate on, probably the remidisivir, this is one of them, favibrivir, this is the second one, and probably the hydroxychloroquine. You can see all of these, they have been approved drugs. None of them, they are new to the coronavirus specific, simply because you would like to avoid the experimental approach, the animal model, phase one, phase two, and you would like to jump straight away to phase three because they are already approved for another drugs or for another treatment. And that's why what we call it repurposing all of this medication directly into phase three clinical trial because we know the efficacy and safety in the other viruses or in the other disease problems because there is no time, obviously. The chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, a story that all of us probably we are aware of, very well-known drug to all of us, anti-malarial, SLA, rheumatoid, cheap, uh, safe, particularly in pregnancy, and it is available. One of the problems of the new drugs like the remidisivir, if it becomes available, how they can produce huge amounts because it will be only one company will produce it because of the patent. They will not leave this patent to anybody else. So that only we will one company to produce a drug for two and a half million. So it, I mean, the availability of the drug, it's a very, very big problem. And one of the, say for example, the anti-IL-6, uh, the tomisilizumab, it is now finished in Italy and Spain, simply because they have consumed all of it in this problem. So the availability is one of the crucial issues that we need to look into it. So the hydroxychloroquine nearly is available. Uh, experimentally, at the experimental evidence, yes, it reduces the viral replication of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the uh, effective concentration, 50% inhibition, is around 6.1, which is great, to be honest. If it is in single figures, it will be great. Uh, there is no strong evidence to support its use in MERS or SARS. They didn't use it in MERS or SARS. Uh, for the current pandemic, the evidence is very, very poor, to be honest, so far. There is no evidence to support its use. How? We have got, I mean, Jao et al., they have just published, uh, like a news, uh, not I mean peer-reviewed article, or presented, or presented their uh, work in somewhere. So I mean this, uh, they have published an experience of a hundred patient treated with treated with hydroxychloroquine. Sorry, I have to switch this off. Thank you. Sorry for that. So they have, I mean, published their uh, experience uh, with 100 patients uh, patient treated with uh, hydroxychloroquine. They found better radiologic, uh, radiological finds, uh, findings. Uh, the viral clearance is better. Disease progression is better. But they didn't define very clearly what is the meaning of the viral clearance, what is the meaning of the disease progression, and they didn't have any control group. Might be a better evidence came from uh, France when they have looked into around uh, 36 patients. Uh, 16 patients have about, I mean, a standard of care and 20 patients received hydroxychloroquine. Amongst these 20 patients on the hydroxychloroquine, six of them they have received also azithromycin. And they said that they are doing definitely better the hydroxychloroquine group compared to the uh, those who didn't receive the hydroxychloroquine group. Clearly, there is a very poor evidence why that the sample size is very small and we don't know what's been happening 
to those who have taken the, az uh, the azithromycin with the hydroxychloroquine because both of them, they can cause the QT interval prolongation. Uh, they said that the azithromycin combination for this six patient, they have uh, produced 0% mortality rate compared to around maybe 12% mortality rate for those who have received uh, nothing or the standard of care. How it works, it interferes with the viral entry uh, at the receptor ligation, at the glycosylation of the uh, spike protein and the host, and also it increases the endosomal pH because this virus likes to be acidic rather than alkaline for the, uh, for the uh, virus vesicle. That's why increasing the uh, endosomal pH will inhibit the virus replication. Uh, also, it works as an immune modulatory and reduces the cytokine production and lysosomal activity, as I mentioned. The next one, the remedisivir. Remedisivir, we said that it is one of the RNA, dependent RNA polymerase inhibitor. Uh, it competes with the natural ATP in a ratio of three to four. So the virus can take three of the drug because it is a nucleoside analog. So the virus can take three of the molecules versus uh, out of four. Uh, someone can ask, so what about the human being? Because the ATB is a common, uh, common molecule for the human being. The ratio is around one to 400. So it doesn't go that much or doesn't compete that much with the human ATB. Uh, the question is how it works. Once the virus, uh, once, sorry, the uh, drug, molecule engage itself in the RNA molecule, what will happen? There is an exonuclease with one of the non-structural protein of the virus, which can pick up. This is one of the strongest mutation in this virus to make it very virulent. It checks up any foreign nucleotide and removes it straight away. The remediasivir has got advantage. It is not recognized by this exonuclease. Ribavirin is well known by the exonuclease, that's why it doesn't work, because it clears it uh, continuously by the exonuclease of the virus. But this one is, uh, I mean, is not clear to the, to the exonuclease, that's why it goes to the virus without any problem, and after maybe three molecules from the drug, the RNA replication stops. They have tried this drug because the RNA, as I've said, the RNA virus, they make mutations all the time. So they have propagated it in many th cell lines. And they have discovered that they, they created resistance to the virus in the experimental model to remedy severe. But they found that the resistant strains very, very less virulent compared to the original strain. OK? Uh, clinically, did we find, uh, uh, you can see the EC, uh, C50 is 0.7 compared to the hydroxychloroquine is 6.1. So it is great drug, and it's used only once a day. Uh, they have tried it in Ebola for, in the non-human, and it worked. But when they tried it in human, it didn't work in the Ebola in 2014. Um, experimentally on the cells and in the mice infected with the cough, it reduces the lung, uh, the lung viral tetra and the, weight, and the weight loss and the hemorrhages within the lung. Uh, but as I'm saying, if we look into the uh, the drug, it is ineffective in the Ebola with the fatality rate is 53%. Some people, they are arguing against that, saying that the Ebola disease itself is completely different from the uh, SARS-CoV-2, simply because the receptor of the Ebola virus is available everywhere in the body, and the remediasivir will not be able to combat this one. And also, the mortality rate in Ebola is very high anyway. The comparable arm when it is, was 53 for the remedy severe, was around 30%. So it's not that much high. And it was 30% for a monoclonal antibody to the Ebola virus. There are now six ongoing trials for the remedy severe across the world. The company stopped to support any more trials, saying that we are not going to sponsor any more trials until we see the efficacy and the safety of this drug. They started with a trial in the States with a 400 patient, and the people argued that 400, the power calculation will be very small, and they have increased the number of the cases to be 2,400. And today, if you look into the Medscape, they were challenging them 
because they don't have a placebo arm. And they said that this might invalidate all what we are, I mean, uh, spending or investing in this trial. So please, please try to make some sort of protocol uh, change by putting an arm with the placebo. Uh, why all this came from the remedesivir? It's just only simply because of this New England Journal of Medicine article, which they have published an experience of a 63 patient. 30 of them, they have been mechanically ventilated. When they have been given the remedesivir, IV, 17 successfully extubated. But you need to look into the sample size. You need to look into the safety of the drug, which we don't know so far. There was no control group. Don't forget the follow-up interval was very tiny. This drug is not available, except for a compassionate use, only for children less than 18 years or pregnant or for a clinical trial, and they refuse to do any more clinical trials except the ones ongoing now. One of the interesting things, if you look into the clinicaltrials.gov, you will see that among the six trials, one is terminated, although, although they have achieved already 50% of the recruitments in China. Why they have stopped it and terminated, I don't know. Might be because of the efficacy. But to be honest, if the efficacy is the case, then they have to declare it and to publish it but nobody has, uh, has, be, has been aware about anything like this so far. It has been terminated around maybe a couple of weeks ago and we don't have any more information why they have terminated it, although they have recruited 50% of their cases. Um, that's it for the remedesivir. Any questions so far, you can stop me at any time. Right, okay. Favibrevir, the Avigan. The Avigan or the Favibrevir, this is the uh, Japanese drug, not approved in the FDA, uh, by the FDA so far. It is approved for the influenza uh, in 2014. Uh, the EC50 is 61 compared to 0.7 for the Remedisever, obviously. Uh, it is a pro drug, again, like, exactly like the Remedisever. It, I mean, it engages itself in the, uh, the nucleotide chain of the RNA and it can be easily picked up by the exonuclease. We don't know so far whether this will be picked up by the exonuclease or not. It inhibits the RNA polymerase and stops the uh, replication of the RNA. It is well tolerated at high doses. The clinical data from the influenza and the Ebola was encouraging. And there are six ongoing clinical trials for the Favibrevir. Still, we are waiting to know what is the outcome of that? Uh, the positive effect, you can see the mortality rate for the Ebola was around 20% versus the target, which is 30%. They were looking for a target of 30% mortality, and it was 20%. Uh, when they compared it now in, uh, for some small clinical trials uh, against the lobinivir, which is the anti-HIV treatment, they found that the radiological improvement for the Fevibrevir group, uh, group was a lot better than the Lubinivir group, 91% versus 61%. But the sample size, again, was very tiny sample size. Uh, there was no difference versus the Arbidol or Yomifinivir, which is the Chinese-Russian one. Ribavirin, all of us know the ribavirin. It is again one of the RNA dependent RNA polymerase inhibitor. It is a guanine analog like the remedesivir. Uh, the problem is to achieve inhibitory effect on the virus. In the experimental model, you need a 400 micromole compared to 0.7 for the remedesivir. Simply because of the problem of the exonuclease. Because the exonuclease clears straight away the ribavirin molecule from the RNA. So it doesn't work. Uh, more important than that, it caused the hemolytic anemia. When they have tried it in the uh, SARS-CoV, and when they have tried it in MERS, 40% required blood transfusion of the patient, and 60% developed hemolytic anemia, and 75% developed transaminitis. Transaminitis. So they have looked into, I mean, because the ribavirin was the only drug available with the interferon, in the 2002 and 2003, when they have tried it for the SARS. 
And the, I mean, when they have done a meta-analysis, they found the 26th study of the 30, it is, the efficacy was inconclusive for the SARS, not for the COVID-19. Uh, the COVID and they found that even four studies harmful because of the hematological problem that I have managed. So no clinical benefit noted also in MERS. So it is, I mean, the bottom line is, doesn't work in the COVID-19. And that's why no trial is ongoing for this one for the COVID-19. The protease inhibitors, they were known for the HIV. Uh, we have got three ones. We know them very well for the HIV treatment. The lupinavir, retinavir, obviously this combination is just to increase the half-life of the lupinavir. You are giving the retinavir in 100 milligram to prolong the half-life of the lupinavir in the, in the system. Uh, the other one is called uh, nilofenivir. Nilofenivir stopped for quite some time now because the HIV developed resistance to it and they are not using it anymore, although experimentally shown a very strong inhibitory effect on the COVID-19. So the two proteas, uh, proteas that we know in the RNA virus of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID-19, the three chemotrypsin-like proteas, and babine-like proteas. No drugs on the babine-like proteas, only one from the HIV called the Danuvir, and uh, there is only one clinical trial in China, and I don't know much about it. But the lubinivir and retinivir, many they are trying it at the moment, because it shows some effect in vitro in MERS and SARS, but there was no randomized control trial, no observational studies, just only case reports. So the clinical data from SARS and MERS were very limited. Now, they say or claim for the COVID-19, if you delay the administration of the lobinivir and retinivir more than seven days, they will not work. They compared it in a small study against the standard of care uh, in the COVID-19, and they found that the time to improvement and the viral clearance and uh, 28 day mortality, there was no difference. So there is not much effect. Probably it is inhibited by some way or the other. The problem is there are a lot of problems with the HIV uh, treatment, uh, as we know, because of the drug, drug interactions and has got also liver dysfunction. And you, I mean, anyone has got ALT elevated prior to start this regime, you can't give the lubinivir or retinivir. And this is obviously a limiting uh, factor because many of those patients with the cytokine storm has got liver dysfunction. And there are uh, nine ongoing clinical trials across the world for this uh, combination. The Arbidol, as I said, it is just only licensed in uh, Russia and uh, China for the influenza. Uh, it inhibits uh, which, where it works it inhibits the interaction between the spike protein of the virus and the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor of the host. Uh, it is effective, I mean, in vitro against the SARS-CoV. Uh, they say or claim reduced the mortality uh, in 67 patients when they compare 37 versus 30, but it's a very small sized trial. When they compared it to the Fevibrivir, they found the Fevibrivir is slightly better in the symptom-wise, the fever and cough. Other treatments with potential uh, effect against the COVID-19. As you can see, I have spoken about and discussed the viral replication element. I didn't talk at all about the immunology or the immune dysregulation, uh, including the IL-6 uh, or including the, 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 the tocilizumab, or serolimab, uh, or the uh, hypergamma globulinemia, or the, uh, the immune uh, plasma from the recovered patients. I, I didn't talk about all this, the interference, but I will just briefly summarize what's going on here for the rest still under experimentation. Nilfenivir, uh, Nilfenivir the, uh, the one from the uh, HIV, they are under trial now, uh, trying to just uh, repurpose it again. Uh, experimental evidence suggests it works very well. The interference, they don't work and they should be in combination. I spoken about the acute pancreatitis drug, which is the camostat, which works on the serine protease. Steroids. 
if there is any role in the, for the steroids in these cases, the bottom line, no. And the CDC recommendation and the WHO recommendation, please don't use the steroids unless for another indication. Say, for example, refractory shock or COVD. Other than that, there is no much evidence to support the use of the steroids, at best, maybe even harmful. Conclusion. COVID-19 outcome is due to, uh, is, is unclear up to now, whether it is because of viral replication or because of immune dysregulation or because of both. There is no drug so far approved for COVID-19. The publication number is like a tsunami, very huge and needs careful appraisal before decision making. Be careful, many of the cases has been included on the same study in a different journal. Just be careful about that. You can see that the New England Journal of Medicine for Medisivir, they have published and they said that our cases has been published before and we have included in our series. Uh, 3,000 drug has got a potential candidate to work under 30 patent with a 500 biologic patent as well, antibodies, vaccines, cytokines, but still we don't have anything up to now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kosi, for this very nice and stimulating presentation. And uh, I invite the, uh, all my professors and the colleagues to start the discussion. If you have any questions, please participate with us. Dr. Ahmed Halawa, uh, we are uh, honored to have you with us for the second um, session of SNT uh, in the battle, and you shared uh, with us the last uh, the meeting about your experience in transplantation. Uh, so uh, I'll be happy to hear from you, Dr. Halau. Uh, thank you very much you know, for this introduction. Uh, I'm wondering when should be using these drugs, mild or asymptomatic cases to prevent progression of patients who critically ill and might be ventilated? Shall I no, answer? Because the I, I don't know the answer. I keep, keep looking around to see whether we, you know, to specify the indication, to make it more clear. It's not clear. None of these drugs to be used without trial. If it is for a trial, yes, at least in the UK here. Any of these drugs cannot be used at all except in a trial. Uh, having critically ill patients, is it not an indication? Including the one I told you about my colleague who has died. I've been in discussion today about using the tomosilizumab as uh -huh. an anti-IL-6. And they said that the chief medical officer of England said that if it is not for a trial, no use. But, but this is not the, the general rule, Professor Rukosi, because yeah. in each country there is a recommendation. So yeah. I, I am aware by at least uh, nine or 10 recommendations and they both on the, in the, in the story of the patient in the clinical presentation uh, some of the antiviral drugs. So there is heterogeneity in the use of these drugs, like uh, anti, anti remdesivir or uh, ritonavir based, whatever they used. So each country has uh, its own protocol. Uh, so, can I can just uh, I mean, uh, the use of these drugs is not uh, uh, is not restricted to clinical trials. Uh, can I add a comment here? I mean, yes. for the UK and for the states, the same. Don't use any of these drugs unless it is in a clinical trial. This is the FDA recommendation, not to use any of these drugs except in a clinical trial. Remedisivir, in particular, is not available. It is an experimental drug so far. What is available, the Favibrivir, which is the Japanese one, they can use it. Uh, what is available also, the Lubinivir and Retinivir, the anti-HIV one, they can use it. And the, all the, I mean, the papers coming up, is coming up from using it. But what, how, what are the dose that we can use it? We don't know. How effective or not, we don't know, because they have not been in a randomized clinical trial to say that they are effective and safe. But if, if you go to you, the title of Remedesivir in New England Journal of Medicine, Compassionate Use. Compassionate, compassionate use. Yes, yes, this means that it's not randomized control trial, it's cohort of patients. That's right. I mean, they, what they have said that this drug is only available for compassionate use, for those who are less than 18 years. And if it is, I mean, the, you have to apply for this compassionate use. 
but the drug, the company, as I'm saying, rejected now to do, and I have been in contact with the company just yesterday, and they've sent an email about yes. the clinical trials. And they said that we have stopped any clinical trials so far and waiting for the results from the states about these 2,400 patients to see whether it is effective or not and whether it is safe or not. Dr. Hassel Fishawi. Uh, I'm very thankful for you, Professor Dr. Mohsin, for this elegant lecture. It is really much. very, very helpful for us. And <laughs> <laughs> I have several questions. What's your opinion about the drug Ivermectin? Does it have a place for treatment of COVID-19? What's your opinion? Uh, to be honest, there were some claims that it might work, but if you look into the experimental evidence or the clinical evidence, there is nothing. It is yes. experimental. And it is experiment. approved as antibrazide, but if they approved as antibrazide, but it is not, it is still experimental against COVID-19. Experimental, yes, but clinical, we don't know. Yeah, yes. we don't. I have another question also. also. What about the drug which is known as ataz atazanavir? Uh, what is the atazanavir? I don't know, to be honest. Atazanavir, this is a viral protease inhibitor, okay? Right. And it, it, have, it have been in several trials uh, tried for treatment right. uh, in this situation. Uh, and uh, some results, of course, are not, are not sure about this, uh, the, the evidence of this drug, but it is one of the drugs that is being tried now for treatment in some trials for COVID-19? Uh, I don't have a clue, to be honest, myself. Okay. I, uh, I, don't know. I think the, in the experimental work, Dr. Hussein, there are uh, uh, hundreds of drugs that can interplay with the virus. Yes. But uh, what reached clinical arena, I think they are limited. No, yes. Very. Yeah, very. And yeah. I want to ask you, Professor Dr. Mahfoussin, for two issues. What about treatment with plasma infusion from infected patients that they have in their uh, in, in their blood, the IgG. Yeah, they have said it's that there are, there are reported cases that they, I mean, made a good response to these cases. And the FDA has approved a guideline for how to just induce it and how to prepare it. But again, we don't have a clear cut evidence that they do any benefit. So yes, far. because why I've said that, because at the start of the Apiola virus, uh, a lot of studies have been tried, tried on plasma, uh, if, uh, plasma infusion, and it was some benefits. Mm -hmm. And some claims that in some trials that of plasma infusion may give a benefit because the, here you are giving the antibody that may be as antidote for the virus itself. This theory seems logic, and I'm not sure why it is not really that with that success in the practice, in the clinical practice. Because uh, when I read in this, they, they wonder that uh, okay. the benefits, as you have uh, mentioned, is not that hopeful, in spite that, theoretically, it may go well. Uh, to be but, honest, I mean, in theory, it should work, because the vaccine will work in this, uh, I mean, in this way. But I don't know how far it can work, or at which stage, because one of the questions that we don't know, when you start the treatment, do you start it before the symptoms start? or when the patient started to require oxygen, at which stage will the, be, the drug will be effective? Yes, I, I, I think, of course, there is no obvious answer for this. Mm -hmm. But as we know that in the viral infections, usually the earlier the starting management, the better. Because when you are starting early, you have a, a milder form of replication. You have an, an, a normal, a lesser number for its affection with no actual organic destruction, such as the pneumonites and the presence of injury and before the stimulation of the, of the cytokine storm, which may be the killing one in most of the situations. Most of the situations were killed from the, the cytokine storm more than the viral pneumonitis itself. Okay. So that's why nobody knows when you start, say for example, the tocilizumab. Yeah. You start it, say for example, once the, I mean, the patient becomes symptomatic or once the patient requires a non-invasive ventilation, when? We don't know. Tocilizumab, yes. I, I, yes. I, yes, I, I, am, I, I prove your words totally, but they have some suggestions. One of these suggestions, if you have measured the level of interleukin-6 and it is, or interleukin-18, uh, especially if, if it is, was high, it may be beneficial. 
Some mentioning that when uh, you have the presence of ARDS, because here ARDS is mainly immunological response, this may be beneficial. So they are trying that I can measure by measuring interleukin-6 or, or uh, either that if you have a starting ARDS, this may be theoretically the most proper time that you can start this management because this is the theory to suppress the interleukin-6 receptor. Okay. Right. I have to admit there are many ongoing trials for the tocilizumab in particular to see yes. whether it's effective or not. Yes. Okay. I, I want to ask you, what's your opinion about... Dr. Hussain, just, just uh, we'll take a question from Dr. Halawa. Yes. Okay, just to, to give a chance for everyone to ask. Yeah, you know, uh, much much interest paid, um, you know, to interleukin six, but there are loads and a wide variety of of cytokines released, like you know, interleukin one alpha and uh, the tumor necrosis yeah. factor and all sorts of things. Any trial? Why interleukin six in particular? You know, been uh, attracting all this interest, and any other trial? Um, showed or addressed the value or the effect of antibodies neutralizing the other cytokines. There are ongoing some trials on other cytokines like the IL-17. Yeah, but the problem is they found that the uh, one of the poor prognostic parameters, the IL-6 level. Once oh. you see the IL-6 level is high, the mortality will be very high. So probably neutralizing this one, and uh, I mean, they might have some sort of a good impact. And because it works also on the cytokine storm, the IL-6, and they have tried it uh, before. So they assume that it might work better. Yes. Try the, uh, the I want to add this here. Yeah, uh, Excuse me. And they have found, plus that it's, it's the most uh, worst prognostic element, they found that the highest level of interleukin that had been released was interleukin-6. So they are thinking that if this is the highest level, so suppression of this interleukin-6 may be beneficial in suppressing of the disease. And so that they have postulated the H score. They have made for this patient H score and classified it to low, low score, middle score, high score. If the patient with high risk score and the high risk of mortality, most of them have a very high level of interleukin-6. So that here was two recommendations to start here uh, steroid shots to suppress this cytokine storm and to give tocilizumab to suppress this interleukin-6, which may be beneficial for suppression of the cytokine storm. I know this, all of these are theories, just theories. The same like in transplantation, interleukin-6 and its pathways for antibody mate rejections. Yes. This is why it is uh, tested nowadays in trials for chronic antibody mediated rejection. Dr. Ahmed Halaw, there is no evidence. Yes, there is no evidence. No, no evidence for anything. Dr. Anto, uh, Antonius Samuel, I have a question. Uh, uh, the virus can use AC2 receptor. So yes. Would, uh, yes, please. Yes, it uses the AC, uh, AC2 receptor. Are they beneficial? Uh, so I'm going to, uh, to answer this question in my presentation. Uh, just to, for, for being the time. Uh, for hydroxychloroquine and reflexes, Dr. Mohsen, is there yes. any evidence to use it for No, no evidence. It's still an ongoing trial. And we are participating in this trial to use it for the healthy care, uh, the healthy, healthy, healthy care workers to try to use it and see whether it will make any difference at all or not. We used, it, we used it here for uh, reflexes after exposure to a case of COVID-19 for mm -hmm. healthy care workers, and so for doctors and nurses. Uh, mm -hmm. So, but, but still the evidence is lacking. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Hussein, can I, can, yes. can, can I have a comment here? Okay, please. In, uh, in the Egyptian protocol, they have put in hydroxychloroquine for the management, plus erythromycin, plus Tamiflu for the management of COVID-19 and for being given as a prophylaxis for the contacts okay. of those which, with COVID-19. Yes, right. The yes. Tamiflu, I don't think that has got any evidence from the SARS, yes. from the MERS, and I'm not sure that has got any evidence for the uh, COVID-19. Uh, I don't know now, it is, is it making any, I mean, in the Egyptian cohort, does it make any better? I don't know. Maybe Professor I, May? 
I would be interested to know. No, I, I haven't heard. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I'm not sure about the uh, the Tamil flu. No, I haven't heard about it uh, that much. Uh, I mean, we don't have any evidence about its use in practice. Actually. Neither in the literature, to be honest. I mean, the Tamiflu didn't show any evidence in the SARS, in the yes. uh, MERS, neither in the COVID-19. Okay. Uh, uh, can I ask a question, Professor Hussein? Fadal. Have a space? Fadal. You want to ask uh, uh, my dear Professor Dr. Mohsen, what about the use of IVIG? I don't know. To be honest, it's a good question, and it has been tried in a few cases, but I don't yes. know the answer. Nobody has commented on it, to be honest. Would you please, uh, Dr. Mohsen, would you please stop the chair from your side? Why? Sorry? Stop the chair of the, your screen, please. Uh, I see, sorry. Right, okay. okay. Fine. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, I have a last question here. Yes. Some have been postulated that when we are giving genus kinase inhibitor for binding cyclin G, this may inhibit the viral entry via endocytosis such as Peritisitinet, which have been used previously in the Pula virus and the Hunter virus. What about your opinion in using Peritisitinet? Uh, to to uh, be honest, I can see that there are th uh, 3,000 candidates, uh, drugs can be used, but still the evidence to support any of these is not, yes. there is no evidence. I mean, yes. at, the, at best, I mean, from the uh, observational studies published so far for the COVID-19 from China and from Italy, 250 patients, yes. which is not, I mean, is not enough to judge a conclusion. Yes, yes last question. The so, drug which is known as Darunafavir and Copacistat, the, which is uh, a viral protein inhibitor. The Copacistat is just as an experimental so far. Yes. So what's your protocol in UK now? <laughs> standard, <laughs> as a standard of care. What is the standard of care? I mean, antibiotic for the bacterial infection, antibiotics for the uh, temperature, uh, proper hydration, and if needs, I mean, uh, oxygen, just, uh, I mean, the old grades of oxygen, starting from just, I mean, nasal cannula, going through the non-invasive ventilation up to the mechanical ventilation. They or, are not putting any drug? clinical trial. Well, they are not putting any antiviral therapy or hydroxychloroquine in the urine protocol? None, unless it is a part yes. of a clinical trial. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Moss. All right, thank you very much. Just a minute and I'm, I'll be ready. One minute, please. Uh, I'm preparing my slides because there is a problem in the computer. There is a very big problem. So uh, would you please uh, make some discussion until, uh, uh, give me one minute just to, uh, to prepare my slides. Okay? Yeah. So you can continue discussion for a couple of minutes because there is a problem okay. in, the, in the computer. Dr. Boxen, I want to ask you a question. What's your opinion in erythromycin in this situation? Erythromycin. Azithromycin, yes. Oh. Azithromycin. As yes. I'm saying, the only evidence that's been published is this uh, cases from the French group. When they yes. have tried, I mean, six patients uh, with the hydroxychloroquine and the azithromycin, and the mortality rate was zero, according to themselves. Uh, obviously, uh, they didn't comment at all. The combina this combination didn't make any difference for the uh, QT interval because we know that both of them, they can prolong the QT interval. Um, 
where the number is very small, we can't judge, I mean, a conclusion from just a six cases. It is yes. I mean, extremely, extremely weak evidence, to be honest. Yes, because here in Egypt, our protocol is to give hydroxychloroquine plus etromycin, provided that the patient is not a cardiac patient. Plus, I know that there is no evidence with the Tamiflu. Uh, this is uh, our Egyptian protocol. Mm -hmm. I know that it, it is not supported, but uh, it's a just a trial. Uh, so because what these drugs are available and they're cheap and safe for the patient, relatively safe. Why not? To, I mean, why not to be part of a trial? To be honest, to see whether this will make a difference. Because I mean, Ross, can can you raise your voice? I can't hear you. Sorry. What I'm saying is, with this protocol, would be very beneficial if it can be a part of a trial to see whether this will make. I mean, I mean, what are the outcome of this protocol? Is it, I mean, positive, negative, no effect? I mean, to be uh, more uh, rationalized. Yes. Rather than just and, they, and you don't know. Yes. Now, now we have a study. Egypt is going now, but it's still starting to compare those which have received these drugs with the, those who doesn't receive these drugs. Excellent. That would be great. I want to ask uh, Dr. Mohsin, you for your own, a, a, a very political uh, question. And I want you to know your opinion. Right. Do you think this is, was uh, a, a, a biological weapon and was dispersed wrongly? I don't know. Uh, mm. This is the, I mean, the politicians, they can answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> and the intelligence people, but not me. <laughs> well, um, Why that is simply because, I mean, I mean, the last uh, statement has been, I believe yesterday or the day before yesterday saying that it is definitely coming from an animal source and still we are striving to know what is the intermediate or the animal reservoir for the COVID-19. Or the SARS CoV 2. Still, yeah, I think that the, 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 it's uh, is what, the bats. Okay, Dr. Hussein. No, 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 no. The bats they are the originating for okay. the virus. But there is, I mean, one link because the bats is not directly linked to the human. But there is another animal, like the camel for the MERS, like the uh, cats for the SARS. For this one, they suggested the pangolin. But I mean, whether this is the pangolin is the one with the reservoir or not, we don't know. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Al-Qusi, for your presentation and for your patience with the discussion. Thank you very much, Professor al fishawi for your uh, interactions. It, it, it enriched this meeting. I'm going to start my presentation as uh, an update. It is, uh, we are speaking about two months or three months viral illness. So everything is, every day there is a change. Everything, there, every day there is update, but up to this moment, the evidence of management, as mentioned by uh, Professor Halawa, still the evidence is uh, very weak for management. So this, this is the third meeting of the Egyptian Society of Nephrology, and the, today we uh, had Professor Al-Qusi presentation. It was elegant. It showed how the evidence is still lacking. We are waiting further studies for the proof of antiviral treatment. And this, this was the first uh, journey of SNT in the battle of uh, COVID-19 on March and April. And today I'm going to highlight some interesting points in continuation to what we discussed before. So to start with, COVID-19, as Professor Kosi mentioned, is one of the greatest global public health crisis. To the extent it is, uh, it is the next to the pandemic of influenza on 1918. So uh, after 100 years, we are living uh, in this uh, uh, very furious disease. As uh, the father of medicine, Sir William Osler mentioned, medicine is a science of uncertainty. Treatment of COVID-19 is full of uncertainty. We are not certain of any evidence for efficacy and sometimes it is very difficult to test the management in the straightforward, big, uh, powerful, randomized control trial with placebo. Although there are ongoing trials using placebo in the management. And I think uh, when we discussed with Professor Halawa last meeting, do you agree about placebo? And he said it is difficult to accept placebo. I think if the evidence of treatment is uh, very low, we can accept placebo and, uh, and placebo after the with discussion with the patient 
and added on supportive treatment. This is why there are some, although they are few, a randomized control trial using placebo in their arm. Again, it is pandemic as uh, uh, shown by WHO. We have now uh, before the, this meeting to uh, and, and probably 2.6 million mortality is uh, approaching 7% and it is quite high mortality and still a recoverability in the uh, one quarter of the cases. So we are hoping and dreaming uh, for the vanish of coronavirus in, uh, 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 in very short time. We hope so, but it seems that we, st we are still living with corona for a period of time. This is the data of Egypt. We have now 3.49 thousand patients uh, affected, uh, active in 2.3 thousand, uh, death uh, 264, and recovered 870 cases. If we look at United States, the United States, the number of affected persons, 809 thousand cases, so quite large number mortalities, 44,000. So we are uh, speaking about a very bad pandemic. Regarding diagnosis and treatment, up to up till uh, this moment, the best diagnosis is to prove the presence of virus by testing by uh, uh, RT-PCR. This is a very nice article published in the Annals of Internal Medicine uh, on a few days back. Uh, discussing the different, different aspects of diagnostics. So the standard of care is a laboratory-based RT-PCR or nucleic acid testing assay, this is the, and the approved from nasopharyngeal. Uh, although uh, bronchoavular lavage is uh, exciting, but uh, there is no agreement about bronchoalvar lavage to take sample because of dissemination of infection. Although this is a standard, we have uh, false negative results especially if it is done so uh, very early in the disease. This is why if we have negative results and the clinical presentations are very suggestive of COVID-19, we should repeat the test. And we have here point of care sampling, either for the antigen or testing for IgM and IgG. And there was a question in the chat, it, it, it is IgM or IgG, I think, Depending on IgM and IgG in the very early pandemic, it is not a wise decision because it takes time for development of antibodies. The primary response for infection is IgM and then IgG. Uh, we hope from the initial studies that proven uh, efficacy of convalescent serum that IgG will be protective, not like HCV because IgG against HCV is not uh, or CMV is not protective at all and it is indicative of infection. We hope from the initial results of convalescent serum that IgG means that we got immunity against COVID-19. So the key summary of the diagnosis according to the annual review, laboratory-based molecular testing uh, uh, is the ideal for detecting SARS-CoV-2 in respiratory specimens. This is the current reference standard for care, for diagnosis. But point of care technology, including uh, uh, serology, IgM and IgG are emerging, but we don't know their efficacy yet. Early massive deployment of SARS-CoV-2 diagnostic for case finding help to control the epidemics because there was some assumptions that for countries with high prevalence, this is because of late diagnosis and the resistance of doing the test or inavailability of the test. Urgent clinical and public health needs now derive an unprecedented global efforts to increase testing capacity. And uh, of sure we can uh, help uh, by clinical history, exposure, and uh, radiological uh, assessment. In the last uh, time, we discussed the rationale of CT scan. Yes, CT scan can show ground glass appearance and it will increase the likelihood of COVID-19, but it's not specific at all. And uh, it may disseminate infection to radiology department, so uh, we can depend on clinical examination, be, uh, oxygenation, chest X-ray finding, and we can follow and CT to be restricted 
to uh, the uh, uh, certain cases according to uh, a high possibility of the disease and not to generalize the use of CT scan. About treatment of COVID-19, I think Professor Rukosi used the, the JAMA article. This is a very nice review about the drugs. And here this is a summary uh, of some drugs like chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. But as you see, this is the dosages. Uh, we should think of contraindications and toxicities because I am aware of abstracts that was submitted to New England Journal of Medicine showing the completely reverse data that the use of chloroquine even makes the situation worsen and the, the patient needs ventilators. So we should be aware of all that uh, uh, data and again and again, drug-drug interactions should be put in mind when we decide to give the drug. ECG is, uh, uh, is recommended, especially if the patient is treated with combination of drugs that may affect QT intervals. Uh, here uh, at uh, Mansoura, we have three review articles written by MD nephrology candidates and uh, reviewed by uh, Professor Halawa. And this is one of them that will be submitted uh, this night, uh, written by Dr. Ahmed Yahya and, uh, and the other colleagues. And one of very interesting data about hydroxychloroquine, uh, Dr. Yahya uh, did this forest blot analysis. So this is a small meta-analysis for is few studies included. And as you see here, the value of hydroxychloroquine used for COVID-19 patients, the value is marginal. According to the evidence, it may be uh, due to this study, which shows no benefit and the large number of patients because the weight of this study is 47%. All other studies, which included a small number of patients, showed some potential beneficial effects. So we are waiting further evidence for the hydroxychloroquine use. Regarding Actemra or tocilizumab, which is interleukin-6 inhibitor that helps in the cytokine storm syndrome, which is fatal, and this is the dose, 400 milligram intravenous, or eight milligram per kg, and the maximum is two doses, and it is, is given by its protocol, intravenous infusion, but be careful because it is contraindicated if there is hypersensitivity and caution in patients with neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, and there is common increase in respiratory tract infection, so it may increase other infection, including tuberculosis, nasopharyngitis, headache, hypertension, increased liver enzymes, infusion-related reactions, and the major side effects, including hematological effects, infections, hepatotoxicity, gastrointestinal perforations, hypersensitivity reactions. So this is why the evidence is important to have an evidence. This is very nice to have an evidence at least for major efficacy. And we can monitor the toxicity if this drug will save lives. Then measure drug-drug interactions. In vitro data suggested interleukin-6 reduce mRNA expression for several cytochrome B450 enzymes, including all these, and this may decrease the level of substrate. So we should review all medications. Then uh, what about the convalescent serum as uh, 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 discussed before? Early application of convalescent plasma in patients with COVID-19 could accelerate clinical recovery. This is based on small studies, and we are waiting further evidence. But I look at the uh, positive data of convalescent plasma as a hope, glimmer of hope, for development and successful vaccine development. Uh, use of steroid, as uh, clearly shown by Dr. Lukosi, the use of steroid is controversial and not recommended by WHO uh, because of the potential of inhibition of uh, viral uh, clearance and the prolongation of the duration of viremia. This is again from the meta-analysis done by Dr. Yahya. It is still under submission. As you see here, the evidence is debatable uh, by the use of steroid. And I think it is reversed to severe shock stage because this is, may be used as um, uh, palliative treatment. Using anti-COVID drugs 
with the kidney diseases, we should be careful because some drugs need modifications and others don't need modification. So this table summarizes the different names of drugs as shown by Dr. Al-Qusi and their phase in clinical trial or animal studies. I'm not going to read the, 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 this table, but if hydroxychloroquine is used in dialysis, it's better to be given after session in hemodialysis patients because it needs uh, modification. And again, the chloroquine may lead to, we are aware by retinopathy, deafness, hypoglycemia, drug-drug interaction, but here there is also renal lipidosis mimicking Fabry disease. So again, this increase the suspicion and the need for uh, an evidence for treating the patients. Immunotherapy, like uh, this drug, camrilizumab, not yet reported, uh, and not, not, there is no available uh, drug modification uh, known, not yet reported side effects, potential program this ligand one, uh, like renal toxicity, increasing interstitial nephrites and others. Monoclonal antibodies, including the drug tocilizumab, it, it is phase four. It seems that they use it because the patient has severe respiratory failure and the cytokine storm syndrome. This is why it is used, as Professor Kosi mentioned, and the main determinants of its use, its availability in the country. So this is, this is a very nice table to be read carefully and to look at the drug modification with renal patients. Then, uh, the, one of the frequently asked questions, have any medical therapies been definitely shown to improve outcome in patients with COVID-19? Till uh, this, this, this is the JAMA article that was published online on the April 13, but up to today, there is no, the answer, simple answer is no. We don't have clear answer for any drugs that can change the outcome of patients with COVID, but we should give the patient the maximum care as we can. Regarding the RAS system, yes, the uh, COVID-19 find, finds its way through binding to angiotensin converting enzyme, isoenzyme 2. But a few words about uh, RAS system. We have angiotensin and, and, uh, uh, angiotensinogen, which is uh, 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 by, by the action of angiotensin converting enzyme, uh, this is ISO 1, is it changed into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2, when it is elevated so much, it is very bad, associated with injury of the tissues, inflammation, fibrosis, everything. So this is high level of angiotensin 2 is considered a devil. Uh, the angiotensin converting enzyme, ISO enzyme 2, is responsible about changing angiotensin 2 into one to seven. So we have angiotensin two, which is bad, works on angiotensin two type one receptor, leading to all this damage. And we have isoenzyme two, angiotensin converting isoenzyme two, which moves angiotensin from two, angiotensin one from two, to angiotensin one to seven. So angiotensin one to seven has the opposite effects of angiotensin two. So it is anti-inflammatory and it protects the tissues. So the problem, the virus binds to angiotensin converting enzyme isotype 2, which is beneficial. And by this binding and taking the isoenzyme, it uh, uh, shifts the reaction toward increase the angiotensin 2 and uh, side effects of the drug. Clinical trials are underway to test the safety and efficacy of RAS modulator. So the problem here, if we use angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or, or angiotensin receptor blockers, does this will increase as a compensatory mechanism, increase angiotensin converting isoenzyme 2? And by increasing this isoenzyme 2, does this increase the viral entry to the cell and replication and the, the, uh, and the situation becomes a determinantal? This is from one of the experimental trials, but it is not proven in human. So clinical trials are underway to test the safety and the efficacy of RAS modulators, including even recombinant angiotensin converting enzyme, ISO enzyme 2, and the ARB like Lozartan in COVID-19. There is a trial for the use of Lozartan to test 
its uh, efficacy and safety in patients with COVID-19. Abrupt withdrawal of RAS inhibitors in high-risk patients, including those who have heart failure or have had myocardial infarction, may result in clinical instability because uh, RAS blockade, either angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, were proven in cardiovascular trials to be very beneficial and to uh, among the first line of management as recommended by the guidelines. Until further data are available, the authors in this article and all societies of cardiovascular hyper and hypertension think that RAS inhibitors should be continued in patients in otherwise stable condition who are at risk of being evaluated for or with COVID-19. So the, the, uh, to stop or not, the answer up to this moment, there is currently no human evidence establishing a link between the use of these medications with an increased risk of COVID-19 acquisition or illness severity. So the simple answer, if the patient is uh, maintained on RAS blockade, especially because of the cardiac indication, please don't interrupt the, the S inhibitor ARBs. Keep them, don't discontinue them, except if the patient has shock and there is necessity to stop all antihypertensive medication. The, and this is the, a very nice uh, hypothesis uh, generating the study, a blockage of SARS-CoV-2 infection by recombinant soluble angiotensin converting enzyme isotype 2. So if it is used and binds here to the, uh, the virus, it will protect the angiotensin converting enzyme isotype 2 pathways and lead to amelioration of the bad pathway of angiotensin 2. So we are waiting many studies that target RAS blockade. Regarding the acute kidney injury, acute kidney injury is uh, the incidence of acute kidney injury with COVID is different from study to study. And for patients with severe uh, respiratory disease syndrome, acute kidney injury uh, percentage is high. And if acute kidney injury is there, in all cases, as we know from acute kidney injury studies, mortality is increased. Uh, this, and this is what's shown here from the Kidney International article uh, shown in hospital death in correlation with uh, many parameters, including uh, baseline chronic kidney disease and the occurrence of acute kidney injury. So on, with occurrence of acute kidney injury, mortality uh, related to COVID increased significantly. And this table shows clearly uh, how the higher degree of proteinuria, higher degree of hematuria, and the higher degree or even stage one acute kidney injury are associated with increased in hospital mortality. So occurrence of kidney diseases is bad news with COVID. How COVID-19 uh, behaves, this is the, I think all of us are aware by uh, this algorithm. We have here a droplet uh, and, uh, and the contact, then uh, the virus finds its way to the respiratory tract, the patient may be asymptomatic, and then the cascade of, of events ends even yeah, either with recovery or cytokine storm and acute respiratory disease syndrome and death. Why this virus causes acute kidney injury? There are many uh, postulated mechanisms, uh, either hypovolemia, the, uh, COVID high volume, high incident acute kidney injury sites, reporting concern of aggressive diuresis induced hypovolemia. Because we don't like hypervolemia, it seems that, and from the initial guidelines and recommendation for critical illness, COVID uh, in the ICU, the, the dogma is, uh, although kidney guidelines in general of acute kidney injury don't recommend the use of diuretics. But here, the rules are recommendation to use diuretics to delay or to reduce the need for dialysis to reduce dissemination of infection. So this may induce hypovolemia, Acute tuber necrosis from cytokine storm, uh, glomer, uh, affection of glomeruli, endothelium, vascular involvement, uh, thrombosis, low perfusion or venous congestion, direct viral infection of the renal epithelium. So there is direct viral effects and indirect effects. And this is a very interesting data. Uh, done uh, 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 renal histopathological analysis of 26 post mortem 
finding this is 26 autopsies in COVID-19 patients, death due to respiratory failure, average age of the patient 69, nine patients showed clinical signs of acute kidney injury, and light microscopic finding documented acute tubular injury, as you see here, and red cell aggregates in the peritoneal capillaries, and by electron microscope, the virus is there in the renal tubules and the podocytes, and by the immune fluorescence is also uh, proven to be within the kidney. So it seems that the virus affects kidney directly. So direct parenchymal infection of tubular epithelial cells and the podocytes with marked acute tubular injury and the erythrocyte aggregation occur in severe lethal COVID-19. This is another case of collapsing. So a lot of mechanisms are there. And one of important uh, point to put in mind when we deal with patients in ICU is to consider the anticoagulation. As we mentioned in the uh, last uh, meeting, and according to Chinese experience, I think anticoagulations were added to the patients, uh, uh, but after balancing the risk of uh, benefit of bleeding and thrombosis, and this is a protocol from the SNE webinar that was uh, held yesterday, uh, and this is the stepwise approach according to the clinical evaluation of the patient and how to use lumulocrite heparin uh, and anticoagulation. Uh, again, the etiology, as I mentioned, a cocktail of causes, including fluid imbalance, uh, interaction between ARTS and AKI, cytokine storm, diet virus cytotoxicity, uh, some case reports about rhabdomyolysis with COVID, hypercoagulability, and collapsing glomerulopathy. What about CRRT? The treatment of acute kidney injury in ICU, we should take care of fluids. We don't like overload, so we should be conservative. The type of fluids, balanced crystalloids, is recommended by the European uh, recommendations of critical care for COVID-19, balanced uh, crystalloid. Hemodynamic support is mandatory and uh, uh, very uh, rec highly recommended. And the drug of choice to support the hemodynamics is noradrenaline. They don't recommend or they don't like dopamine. But what about CRRT? Uh, they, don't encourage, uh, they don't encourage the rushing attitude to do CRRT very early. And there are some uh, preference for the use of CRRT. Why? Because if we use the machine of CRRT in the ICU, this will reduce the transfer of the patient from the ICU to the hemodialysis unit, and this will reduce dissemination of infection. Second point, using of a high volume hemofiltration in a dose of six liter per hour, removed inflammatory cytokines, and improved the sequential organ failure assessment scores at day seven in patients with sepsis. In the last meeting, I, have a, a big, I had a big objection against the plasma exchange, and I'm not sure if uh, Professor Kosi uh, have uh, ideas about plasma exchange. I read a uh, few, uh, two articles or two reports about the use of plasma exchange to remove cytokines, but I don't like plasma exchange in this uh, uh, case be, uh, because I'm afraid of infection. Dr. Kosi, do you like to comment on the plasma exchange in acute kidney injury with cytokine uh, storm? No, uh there is, thank you very much for that. But I mean, there is no evidence for the plasma yes. chain, no evidence even for the hemoabsorption. Okay. For the cytokine removal. Do, but I, 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 my opinion is uh, plasma exchange may increase the risk of infection. infection. But yeah. uh, I find well, some reports about the use of plasma exchange to get rid of cytokine storm in COVID patients. Okay. Uh, regarding the hemodialysis, uh, last se session, Professor Shamis Sayed mentioned clearly the approaches, uh, here I want to stress about, about the typical presentation in hemodialysis. The patient may present with gastroenteritis, so the index of suspicion should be, uh, th uh, the threshold for suspicion should be reduced and to uh, order the uh, testing for the virus because uh, the, uh, everything may be uh, typical in dialysis patients. And this is the case scenario. A patient presents with gastroenteritis, it is okay, but at the end of the day, as you see, fluorid respiratory distress syndrome. And this is the algorithm shown by, by Professor uh, Hisham last time. And I think we should be suspicious, take care of infection control, 
and uh, educate the patients, educate the staff, using protective equipments, and the, there is superiority of negative air if we are dealing with a patient with COVID-19 for dialysis. And this is, in, uh, the, the, there are many recommendations from Europe and from the United States and from Egypt, and uh, we are hoping in the, in the coming days uh, that a group of the Egyptian society or Egyptian with the Ministry of Health, uh, Dr. Mohammed Salah, Dr. Hisham, Dr. Hassan Fishawi, they are responsible about the COVID-19 and the guidelines of Egyptian uh, Ministry of Health guidelines from the nephrology aspects, and they will announce it within a few days. I think the guidelines and recommendations are typically the same, infection control, infection control, and infection control. The area should be ventilated to take care uh, for the healthcare providers. But let me to discuss with you one of uh, a very uh, nice uh, and very, you can say, uh, we don't agree about this concept, how to agree to do twice dialysis in, uh, in the COVID era. Uh, the the uh, stigma, the uh, reasons or the brew uh, uh, of doing less frequent dialysis in COVID era, less exposure to potential coronavirus disease, infection for patient and staff, reduction in dialysis staff work, including reduced time for cleaning or machine between treatments, greater spacing of the patient, redu uh, reduced transportation, con uh, con uh, conservation of personal protective equipments. Although all these are logic to reduce frequency, but we shouldn't take it as guarantee. If the patient is overloaded and doesn't tolerate short sessions, uh, the short uh, the prolonged session, so at this moment we shouldn't curtail and sh we shouldn't reduce the frequency of doing dialysis with the patient. But if the patient is stable, especially if there is residual in output, we can apply this on individual basis. So this is an idea to be retested. Regarding transplantation, which is very exciting because in transplantation, we use immune suppressive medications. And we are expecting that these patients are more prone to uh, COVID-19 as they are more prone to infection in general because this is the price of transplantation is to take immune suppression and to be more prone to infection and malignancy. This is the American Journal of Transplantation when I look at the uh, COVID-19 corner, I find now there are 25 articles. Although all of them are uh, uh, either editorial comments, case reports, case series, uh, opinions, but this is how the publication are there. This is a case, 39-year-old man with combined uh, kidney and heart transplantation. He presents with mild disease, and it seemed that the course of this case is coping with what Professor Halawa presented. The case was mild, the patient refused admission, and the shared uh, decision was in the first step is to stay at home. Nothing given except uh, uh, reducing the uh, microfinite mofetel and leaving the patient in home until he uh, complained of dyspnea. Then he was hospitalized, and then after improvement, he decided he insisted on discharge and he was discharged. So it seemed that in this case, the COVID was uh, mild and easily managed in this case of kidney and heart transplantation. This is the, the uh, other report that I uh, was uh, mentioned in the, in the, I mentioned in the last meeting about seven cases from UK. Some of them uh, uh, had the COVID-19 early after transplantation. So the interval between transplantation and COVID was uh, in three cases was a minimal period of time. And this is uh, the outcome, immune suppression, handling, and this is the patient died, and this patient need intensive therapy. COVID-19 infection in kidney transplant patients can cause severe illness as shown in this category of cohort of patients. Another cohort from Italy, 20 patients, in all these 20 patients, uh, patients were admitted for SARS-CoV-2 pneumonia, uh, and the median from transplantation, uh, 13 years. And they were followed up for seven days. The, this are, this were the immune suppression. All immune suppressive were withdrawn because of severity of the disease. And I think it's wise 
the, the, to follow the wise approach in dealing with immune suppressed patients. If there is mild infection uh, with some lymphopenia, it's better to get rid of antiproliferative drugs, leaving steroid and calcineurin inhibitors, because there are some assumptions that calcineurin inhibitors may have even uh, the antiviral effect by way or another. But, and if the patient situation deteriorates, pneumonia become manifest, we can reduce calcium inhibitor. If the patient is hypoxic, we should stop all immune suppressive medication, leaving a steroid, uh, and then uh, to deal with the patient. So this is what they did. They stopped all immune suppressive medications, and they commenced missile prednisolone 60 milligram, hydroxychloroquine, although it is, there is no evidence but they use it, 200 milligram BID, to reduce the FSMH GFR is less than 30, and this was used in uh, 19 out of 20. Uh, Lubinavir, Tunavir, although this drug will uh, reduce metabolism of tacrolimus, this is why some doctors stop tacrolimus uh, before uh, starting this combination and to uh, repeat tacrolimus level and to keep the level within the window. If the patient is in severe illness, like these cases, should uh, calcium inhibitor should stop, be, be discontinued altogether. Uh, this is another combination in four, in four cases. The outcome, uh, four patients stayed in ICU. Six patients developed acute kidney uh, injury in transplanted kidney. Five patients died. So this is, in this limit, cohort of 20 patients, the, uh, the, uh, the outcome was this month. Again, this is a case of, uh, uh, this is the uh, COVID-19 in solo, this is single center experience from Madrid, from Spain, 18 cases, eight kidney transplant, six liver transplant, and four heart transplant, median age 71 years, median interval since transplant nine years, and they discontinued antiproliferative. Uh, the main presentation was fever in 83% of the patients, and the radiological abnormalities were there uh, in the form of unilateral or bilateral multifocal consolidation in 72%. Uh, this was the most common presentation. Lubinavir, ritonavir, usually associated with hydroxychloroquine, was used in 50% of patients and had to be prematurely discontinued in two of them. And this is how they deal with the antiviral and immune modulatory therapy in line with clinical practice guidelines proposed by Spanish. This is why in the discussion I referred to this, every country has... Uh, uh, its own uh, advices and recommendation, even if it's not based on evidence-based uh, treatment. So Spanish Ministry of Health and the local protocols co-formulated Lubinavir, Ritonavir, in this dosage twice daily, orally for up to 14 days. And I think in, as a commentary on New England paper that was randomized, controlled trial, and showed no beneficial effect of this antiviral, there was a big criticism for this trial that the starting point of antiviral was late. This may be, uh, uh, we don't know. So we are waiting further evidence for the studies, but this is their protocol. They prescribe, uh, uh, this is the uh, interferon beta, 250 microgram every 48 hours, could be added according to the criteria of treating physician on basis of severity of COVID-19 illness and the perceived risk of uh, rejection. Patients with symptoms restricted to the upper respiratory tract normal oxygen saturation and no radiological features of pneumonia could be treated with outpatient hydroxychloroquine monotherapy. Tocilizumab, single 600 milligram intravenous dose was added in selected cases with progressive respiratory failure and increasing inflammatory parameters. The adjuvant's use of uh, low to medium dose corticosteroid was not explicitly in encouraged. Adjustment of immune suppression in this uh, cohort of Spanish Management was left to the insertion of the attending transplant physician. Although tapering maintenance therapy was usually attempted, calcineurin and mammalian target of rabamycin uh, inhibitors were temporarily discontinued upon initiation of uh, the antiviral anti HIV because of drug drug interaction, and the drug serum levels were obtained after uh, two to three days with close therapeutic monitoring thereafter. Baseline deliprednisone dose was usually reduced by 50%. Mycophenolate mofetil, mycophenolic acid was also decreased in patients receiving anti uh, retroviral drug 
the QT interval was regularly assessed in patient treated with hydroxychloroquine. The outcome of Spanish, uh, out of uh, this uh, 18 cases, five died, progressive respiratory failure in four cases, one is stabilized in ICU, eight patients discharged home. Uh, this is another case. It is very interesting because the patient was treated with Pilatacept. If we think of Pilatacept, Pilatacept is co-stimulatory blockade, and there is, if we think of immune suppression, it is bad, but if we think of co-stimulation blockade, it may be beneficial for cytokine release and reduce cytokine, maybe, we don't know. And this is the case scenario, and according to the time, as you see here, the uh, Pilatacept was discontinued here, and then shifted to cyclosporin, uh, uh, and then mycotinimofetel was discontinued, and then after uh, uh, the patient scenario is, uh, the case was mild, they decided to plan for uh, restarting blatacept and MMF on April 14th. So it seemed that the case is mild. Uh, and this is another immune suppressive therapy maintenance in a kidney recipient. Uh, they discuss in this issue another example of the difference in outcome in transplantation because there is a proposed hypothesis that patients on transplantation because of immune suppressive drugs, the cytokine storm is ameliorated. But what we see from the uh, Spanish and from Italian cohorts and even from UK that were published, the uh, prognosis is not uh, so benign. So, so the hypothesis, maintaining immune suppressive drugs could be beneficial in stopping or at least mitigating some kind of storm that usually leads to a poor outcome in the patients and only secondarily in the preventing graft rejection. So we don't like rejection, but in the same moment, we want to keep the patient living. So this is the, another uh, editorial comment or letter to the editor discussing that immune suppression may have some beneficial effects. And this is how the, uh, the, uh, in the Journal of, Journal of American Society of Nephrology discussing the same issue. Uh, should we leave calcium inhibitor until the end? I think taking all this data together, the wisdom of evaluating the patient is mandatory. If the patient scenario is mild disease, he can be treated even in home and just uh, and looking at the lymphocytes, if there's lymphopenia, uh, MMF, or antibiotic drugs to be discontinued and to be left on calcium inhibitors and steroid. And if the situation is severe and the patient dies you with respiratory failure, I think all immune suppressive drugs, with the exception of steroid, to be uh, discontinued because uh, the situation will be fatal. Um, Regarding the national survey, this is a very nice uh, survey because it gives us data from surgeons, from nephrologists, from critical ill uh, doctors who are working with transplantation in the United States. As you see, the, uh, there is a, a complete suspension of live donor kidney transplantation was reported in 70% of live donor uh, and, uh, kidney transplantation and live donor liver in 67%. So it's, it seems that suspension of transplantation program altogether, there is uh, some variability from area to area. Uh, and then this is the number of reported cases of COVID-19 in solid organ transplant recipients uh, categorized by severity of illness. We have mild illness, moderate illness, critical ill in kidney, liver, heart, lung, and total. So I think this is stable is very nice because it gives a good idea about the number of patients affected by COVID-19 among the solid organ transplantation. Again, although the, there is no evidence-based management, but this is a situation, hydroxychloroquine is used here in 52% in mild, 84% in moderate, 83% in critically ill patients, and overall more than three quarters of the patients treated with hydroxychloroquine. Antiviral drugs, Remedesivir is used here in two, uh, in, in timbers, two cases, four cases, here eight cases. So it seems that there is, and here uh, lubinavir, ritonavir, and here the, the number of patients using the drugs. Other agents, as azithromycin and others, starting is inhibitor, uh, nobody starts is or ARP, and this wise, uh, stopping is or ARPs, 
Here, uh, this is a few uh, cases where uh, they stop ACE or ARBs, and this, this may be the two uh, shock stage. Uh, the use of anti uh, uh, manipulation of immune suppression, as we agreed together, anti-metabolites, uh, early uh, discontinuation of anti-metabolites, calcium inhibitors, and the steroids can be kept according to the patient situation. This is the distribution uh, of transplantation program. And as you see, the black circle, no transplant. Here for living donor kidney transplantation, no transplant in the majority of centers uh, with restriction and uh, no restriction is uh, minimal in this uh, cohort of patients. To conclude my presentation, uh, the speed and the volume of clinical trials launched to invest investigate potential therapies for COVID-19 highlight both the need and the capability to produce high quality evidence even in the middle of pandemic. Still up to this moment, we don't have evidence-based medicine. No therapies have been shown effective to date. So, uh, but from the good news, uh, this is, this is the, an opinion. Uh, aftermath, after this disaster of COVID-19, what will happen to nephrology? Is it devastation, damage, or new dawn of for nephrology and the flourish? Uh, it seems that the COVID-19, this is not the ugly phase, it's a good phase to work with humility and to deal with the human being in a very nice way. And the, the, uh, the doctors are now the, uh, considered the heroes and champions collaboration, innovations, using telemedicine, uh, thinking of new modes of dialyzers and, and the dialysis facilities, improving all these may be the, some of the uh, good uh, news. And we are waiting the announcement of the sector of nephrology from Egyptian uh, Ministry of Health that I think it will be released soon. Uh, and this is the, our virtual academy, and this is one of the one of the benefits of COVID-19 is that we have these webinars and lectures and uh, this will enrich our library. So I hope soon to, uh, uh, th this virus will be vanished and to uh, again and again to celebrate the vanishing of COVID and development of immunity against this virus. And thank you very much for, for, your, for your attention. Do you have any questions? Yes, Dr. Dawlat Bilal. Thank you very much to, uh, for Professor Mohsen al usi for his uh, very clear and to the point uh, lecture. And uh, this was also confirmed by the extensive lecture of Professor Hussein Shaisha, which confirmed uh, that the no, no country has a similar policy to another country. Each country has its own protocol and it's rather anecdotal prescriptions. Yes. My question is rather uh, outside maybe the scope of nephrology, it's in epidemiology of the situation. Now yes. you mentioned, Professor Hussain, that a quarter of cases in Egypt have recovered and 81,000 cases in the US have recovered. Uh, and uh, I don't know well, from which stage did they recover? Was it just a flu symptom and the positive test and then it turned negative? Should be, when, should be negative to say recovery. Right. Uh, but we will hear from Dr. al what the, uh, because the, uh, uh, we assume that uh, the, there is a wealth of uh, money and the availability of the test everywhere. I think the institution is not like this. Even in the United States, there is limitation for the use of the test. And I would like to hear from Dr. al the state in the UK, when the test is done, and after a disappearance of clinical symptoms, uh, that the, 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 you repeat the test or the test is repeated for two times to give the patient uh, the uh, signal of uh, b becoming not infective, not infected. My, my question, my, the rest of my question, when these people develop IgG, is this IgG protective to them? They will not contract uh, the... We hope, so, the we hope so, Dr. Dr. Dawlet, in, 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 that the IgG, because we know we have hepatitis B. Hepatitis B antibody against hepatitis B is protective and a friend and neutralize the virus. If we have anti hepatitis S antibody, this means that we are immune. But hepatitis C and CMV, IgG is bad because it denotes infection. Up to this moment, we are not sure of if the IgG of COVID 19 will be protected or not. But the data came from 
some case reports and from uh, small cohorts of using convalescent serum, the, these data are assuring and we hope that this antibody will be neutralizing antibody. And uh, we'll, we will hear from Dr. Al-Qusi and Dr. Ahmed Halawa and Dr. Al-Qusi about this. The rest of my question, Dr. Hussein, I'm sorry. We'll take the question of Dr. Al-Qusi and we'll continue with the question. يعني in the current state of what's happening in Egypt uh, with the attitude of the Egyptian population, are we heading to herd immunity? لأن يعني people who are going to recover will have the immunity by probably this IgG, and the people who are sick are going to die. Are we heading to herd immunity? So that's the question. يعني شيء أجا أجابته يعني. Okay, Dr. Qusi. Right. Thank you very much for that. I mean, first of all, there are three questions as far as I understand. Yes. The first question, when we are testing for the uh, COVID-19. Yes. In the UK, those who are admitted to the hospital and the key workers are the only people who are tested. What I mean by the key workers, the one who are working in the hospital and they start to have some symptoms, non-specific symptoms, and then they will start to say, oh, I'm self-isolating. I'm going home then the manpower and the working capacity will be less. So they say that, please, we will test these people to confirm that they are negative so they can come back to the work. And they so, test the patient for one time or once or twice? I'm coming to this point. Yes. So they are testing the patient just only on admission. Okay. There are many patients in the UK, and that's why I'm saying the mortality rate is not right. The one we have got from the information, the mortality rate that we have got it is from those who are tested, who are admitted to the hospital. But there are plenty of people who have got the symptoms classic for COVID-19 uh, and they are isolating at home and they are not tested. Yes. So in the UK, we are testing only those two categories, those who are admitted to the hospital and those, the key workers, if they have got or started to be isolating themselves for just non specific symptoms. So we do the test. Whether we are doing the convalescence or the recovery, we don't do that. And that's why you might see for the UK numbers, you will see the recovered people, 15 or 115, a very negligible number. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean anything. The second question that I believe it was about whether the IgG is protective or not. Yes. I mean, to be honest, it remains, as, as Professor Hussain said, it remains unclear whether it is protective or not, although there are some reports that the convalescent uh, 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 serum is protective, yes. but also they have reported some patients who have been infective again infective, after they yes. have recovered from the yes. virus. Yes, yes. So still it remains unclear. There but, are many but, but I have very comment, Dr. Mohsa. Uh, does, uh, do they test the serum of patients who recovered by repeated negative tests and they tested them, them for IgG? To be honest, we don't we have know, the we don't know. Test. We don't have the serum test as yet. It's just yes. only all we are doing is the PCR for the for the nasopharyngeal. Because well. those patients who recovered the, the virus recovered the symptoms, and then we are not sure if they developed antibody or not. No. So if they were tested and were proven to have IgG, and then they came with a reinfection, this means that the antibody is not protective. But, but we don't know all these data. So we are waiting further clarification from the future. The third point of the herd immunity, to have or to reach the herd immunity, you have to have around 60 to 70% of the population to be infected. And I'm not sure how we are going to that. Probably if we have got 60 to 70% of the population to be infected, this means that you will lose a lot for that. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, just a little comment, uh, Professor Hussain, from Trouble. the lecture that you have just mentioned. You mentioned a very good point that about the lubinovir and retinovir, that one of the claims that when you started it late, it might not be effective. To be honest, I mean, one of the uh, publications, they have logged into 67 patients for the lubinovir, retinovir versus the standard of care. And the, I mean, the median starting date was around 13 days of the, I mean, the randomization date. 13 days after the start of the symptoms. And they didn't find any difference. But when they have done sub-analysis to those who have started before 12 days, they didn't see any difference either. I know that this is a very limited number. We can't rely on these figures, but still, 
starting early or starting late didn't make a difference. And I think the story, the, the, we should learn from Ebola story because all these drugs were tested in Ebola and they were used like what we do now by, by protocols, different protocol from uh, place to place. But at the end of the Ebola, the all randomized controlled studies or uh, intervention studies revealed no evidence for efficacy for any agents tested in the Ebola era. So we are waiting the uh, ongoing trials. But as you mentioned, one of the, uh, the hope is uh, COVID-19 is not an Ebola. It is a completely different virus. Completely so different. hope that yeah. agents will work. One of the differences they say that the Ebola stays in the brain yes. and that the COVID-19 doesn't affect the brain. So I mean- Alhamdulillah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Halawa? Of course, the people they say that it affects the brain. <laughs> Dr. Halawa? <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, uh, I, we, we presented last time um, a single center experience in, in terms of transplantation. And you can tell that most of the patients being treated uh, and sent home, number one, only one patient out of eight now is already intubated, but she's making very slow recovery. We didn't try any one of these medications, fancy medications, because there is no evidence. And you can tell clearly if you have, however, the number is very small, sample size is very small, even negligible, you can tell clearly that, you know, the effectiveness of these medications may not be confirmed or may not be approved. Because, you know, they have some pneumatic treatment, exactly what we did, reduction of immunosuppression. To the extent some of them, we increased their immunosuppression because they came with the tacrolimus level very low. We're worried about rejection, so we'll put it up. But uh, I have seen some of them back in the clinic. They're doing very well. But again, eight patients means nothing. So the, the case that I mentioned, the cardiac and the kidney transplant case combined, yeah. it, it, this case was among the randomized control trial of remesidivir. Mm. And the, the author of this case were not sure if the patient was in placebo or in the active arm. So it seems that they are brave to include patients with cardiac and... Can, and can I add a point here, <laughs> yes. Professor Zim? Oh. Sorry, okay. I, I mean, the, my point is about the retesting, very important in the dialysis population. Yes. I mean, because this has raised a, a lot of concerns to ourselves. If a patient who is on hemodialysis and has been uh, COVID positive, when we can say that this patient doesn't need to isolate from the rest of the patients in the dialysis unit, because we are being very scared mm -hmm. that he might transmit the infection to the others. And, the, and we don't do the, re, I mean, the retesting unless this patient started to be symptomatic after 14 days is still symptomatic. Then we can't still, I mean, we can't put him on the general ward for the dialysis and we need to retest him in these circumstances. But if he became symptom free after 14 days, we, I mean, allow him without testing even. Yeah. This is the consensus that we have reached to because we're a bit con very concerned. I, I, I think mean, it's a very wise, very wise decision. But I want to ask you about the dialysis unit. Do you have cases in dialysis? Yes. In, in your unit? How many cases? Yes. Uh, the, the frequency of cases every day, you have cases? I ca to be honest, I've got the, I mean, the, uh, uh, if you wait for me for a second, I can get for you the dashboard for the uh, old South uh, Shara, it is, okay. It's not necessarily to know the number of cases, but how to, in a practical way, uh, in, ah, real, in real them. life, to be honest, do a, we are isolating them in special rooms? Definitely, completely isolated. And the uh, staff, they are dealing with them. They should have like this. hepatitis B, like hepatitis B, like, nearly uh, like but, hepatitis B. But, but with protective against uh, droplet uh, infection uh, because hepatitis B is no droplet. Uh, so, yeah, well, and you use negative air uh, controller for the air condition. I'm not sure about this, to be honest. Okay. But what I'm quite sure about, they are nursed in a special okay. room. They are uh, the, the person who is dealing with them from the nursing staff. Uh, with Your protective the, uh, equipments, uh, yeah, yes. Uh, protective equipments. Uh, the patients themselves, they will be isolated in the transport, because the transport gets the patient and they return them back so that he can't sit with the, I mean, uh, with the others. And for the driver, he should have a mask and himself, he should have a mask. Okay. Uh, if he is going home. Dr. Hassan Fishawi. Thank you, uh, my dear professors, for this uh, elegant lecture, Dr. Hassan, and for this uh, very nice discussion. I won't ask you, Professor Hussein, because 
I mean, I think I, I, excuse me, Dr. Hussain, because I look, uh, uh, I see the, the, your recommendations at the committee, uh, you and Dr. Shamsan, Dr. Muhammad Salah, uh, yes. for the transplantation. I like it very much because it is very rational. So congratulations for uh, the, this initiative. And I intended not to use them uh, in this presentation, uh, just to, uh, uh, to have the permission from the committee to use them. So we are waiting the announcement, official announcement, before uh, using them in lectures yes. or something like that. Thank but you for your support but, but, and for this But your question. approach is very nice. A stepwise, stepwise approach, like Dr. Halawa uh, did, uh, starting with antiproliferative, then evaluating the patients step by step, not to be rushing to stopping immune suppression earlier because this will uh, increase the risk of rejection. And in, in the same moment, when the condition worsened, to stop immune suppressive because this is the, uh, the problem of the cases of transplantation. Dr. Dr. Yes, I guess our, our rationality was built upon the same time, the degree of dyspnea, and uh, about yes. oxygen treatment at, at room air and nasal oxygen. We have made uh, an algorithm, inshallah, will be uh, published very soon. But I, I, I want to, to argue with you a, a very important point, Dr. Hussein. You have mentioned in your lecture that you are not in theotism for doing CT chest for suspected patients. I, I, I don't say in, in theotism to do CT scan, but yes. not to be rushing in doing a CT scan for all. Because, in the, because we have, uh, 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 during the last uh, month, we have the evidence to do CT scan because the, there is false negative results of the test. So if CT scan shows the, uh, this consolidation or this uh, basal uh, ground glass appearance, this will be COVID-19, but they are not specific signs at all. And they can disseminate if you uh, uh, are rushing in doing CT scan for all, this will disseminate infection. This is why the International Radiology Societies both guidelines for the use of CT scan. So if the yes. patient, if the patient clinical presentation is okay, clinical examination as well, chest X-ray is fine, uh, oxygenation is good in the room air, why to do CT scan for this patient? And uh, if you are suspicious, repeat the test, because this is yes. the only way. If yes, you I don't have the I... facilities to repeat the test, it is better to follow the patient clinically and to do CT scan when it is, uh, should be done. Yes, I will tell you, Professor Razin, why we have uh, adopted this CT chest and what its role here. Okay. We, we have make uh, our basic uh, concept about the hand experience that they have adopted to, to do CT chest for suspected patients. And suspected patients, they have defined them. Patients with fever exceeding 38 degrees centigrade, patients with severe dry cough, patients with, dys with dyspnea, or patients who were in contact in the previous 14 days with other patients that have COVID-19, uh, proved to have COVID-19 and starting symptoms. At this situation, you haven't the facilities to do this test because it's more expensive than CT chest in Egypt and it is of limited resources. So that if the patient fulfilling the, criteria, the clinical criteria for COVID and starting have shortness of breath in this situation, we will go not for all patients. We will we'll proceed for high resistance chest. High resistance chest is not, of course, uh, of course, it's not diagnostic. It's suggestive because it has atypical presentations and atypical presentations. If the patients presented with one of the atypical, one of the atypical presentations, such as ground glass appearance and others, in this situation, it is it, it is. Advice. I know, Dr. Hussain, if there, if in the era of COVID-19, if you find ground glass appearance and there is suspicion, this will increase the likelihood of COVID-19 so much. And there is a room for CT scan, no way. But this, this, the, the, every day you find a change in the opinions because it's not my opinion only. It is the, the harvest of the opinions of all the leaders of radiology and other departments to use the resources by the wise approach and not to be routine for every case, this is what no, I mentioned. I, I mentioned not routine, but only okay. those patients okay, who are highly to be, suspicious. To be reserved, yes, I agree with you. Yes. N n nothing, no doubt, if the CT yes. scan is indicated to be done. Yes. Uh, here in our center at Eurogia and the first center, even we dedicate portable chest X-ray, not to allow patient who is COVID, suspicious COVID, because we have an isolation room 
for suspicious cases yes. until the test becomes positive. We shift them to the isolation hospital. But while the, uh, the patients, transplanted patients and other patients in the hospital are uh, isolated because of suspicion until we confirm by the, the PCR, the patients are isolated. Every doctor and nurse has the all protective equipment. And then we have dedicated portable X-ray beside the patient to help us in the evaluating the chest uh, whenever, because it is easy to do plain X-ray. Yes, I agree with you, but, but we didn't adopt in Egypt, in our guidelines in Egypt, the chest X-ray because it is of very low sensitivity. Because in okay. different situations, you can do the chest X-ray without obvious evidence. But when you are doing C CT, you will, you, will, you will find starting the ground glass appearance. Okay, I, Dr. Ahmed Halawan, Dr. Halawan, um, Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Hussain Fishal. Uh, I don't see strong indication for CT scan. Why to put everybody at risk to send the patient to the CT scanner? CT scanner, you know, is just for diagnosis, but you can have other diagnostic tools, saturation, for example, yes. clinical examination, plain chest x-ray, all sorts of things. You know, uh, we, in eight patients we have, none of them had CT scan. Dr. Halawa, I, I, I like your comment because I myself was insisting on CT scan since uh, three, three weeks. CT is a must because of false and negative results of the test. But after reading and after seeing the, the, the real life, uh, if you uh, send a patient with suspicious uh, COVID-19 to a uh, radiology ward with CT scan and exposing the workers there, how to uh, make uh, NF95 for all. So it, it will be a problem. Great problem. Yes. Yes, yeah. it will be nightmare. So clinical examination and testing for oxygenation. And now we have in the center a very nice plasismo telling us about the SO2. And if the patient is not dysnic, no shortness, breeze, nothing, uh, the, everything is fine, it's okay. Why to do CT scan? Because we'll not change the management of the patient based on this, this scan. I think yes, Professor Anna Hafiz was asked. Uh, صوتي مسموع ولا محتاج زي الفل يا باشا زي الفل بداية ثانك يو فيري فيري ماتش دكتور محسن الاوسي فور ا فيري يعني illustrative presentation and دكتور احمد حلاوه فور بينج وذ اس اول ذا تايم اي هاف سام كومنتس الحقيقه ذا فيرست وان اباوت ذا ديفرنت سب تايبس اوف ذا فايروس بيكوز وي سي ان ديفرنت كانتريز ديفرنت بروجنوزس سو دو وي هاف ديفرنت سب تايبس ديتكتد اور ات از اونلي Uh, the same uh, virus, but maybe uh, mild cases and severe cases. This is my first question, please. Dr. Kosi, uh, do you have an idea about this? Because I have the uh, impression uh, that there are many types of virus. But uh, this is an impression uh, and a suggestion. Uh, to be honest, I mean, there is, uh, there is some suggestion and theories that there might be two different viruses or three. And uh, yes. to, the point that, to, to the point that when we have had uh, some people Uh, the death rate has increased all of a sudden in the Liverpool area. They said that this coincided when the Real Madrid was playing with uh, Liverpool. Does we, I mean, shall we do the, I mean, testing to see the virus of the infection at that time? It is the same virus being picked up in Spain or it is a bit different. But to be honest, the disparity in terms of the, the death rate or the comorbidities seems to be having maybe not only the comorbidities, the genetic background, to the point that they think that might be the ACE2 receptor varies from some population to the others. If you look into the, our uh, death rate here in the health uh, workers uh, in uh, England, you'll find plenty of them from the uh, Arab and Asian, none from the English people. Whether this is something, uh, I mean, to do with the, I mean, environment or with the genetic background, Nobody knows up to now. So something Thank maybe you. related to the host or related to the virus. We don't and, know. And this will, will this, go, this gives me to the second question okay. because we see, we see that the area of uh, some areas of the world like Africa, for example, are not that uh, badly affected by the virus. Is it simply because of under diagnosis of the cases or as you mentioned, there is some genetic basis Because uh, yesterday, Dr. John Gabour from the WHO, he's working in Egypt here, he mentioned that Egypt has a big 
a problem that they are not doing enough tests. And you mentioned also that in the uh, UK, uh, UK they, they are not also ma uh, making much tests. So do we believe that, uh, that uh, uh, doing uh, less tests is the cause of not reporting much cases, or we have some genetic protection because of African or maybe, uh, I mean, uh, genetic background like many countries in Africa? Or combination of everything. Can I, can I take this point for a, a very important point for the genetic background? You know that the ACE2 receptor is located on the X chromosome, and they are claiming that the mortality rate amongst the males more than the females, and the male has contained only one X chromosome. The female has contained, uh, sorry, has got, just got two X chromosomes. Mm -hmm. Is this doing anything with this problem? We don't know. I mean, some people, they are st started to be working on this issue, but they said that might be this disparity between males and the females coming from this fact that this ACE2, the portal of entry for the virus, is located on only a single chromosome for the males, so you will have only one uh, genetic copy, but for the female, you might have got heterogeneous copy, or heterozygous, sorry, heterogeneous copy, rather than a homogeneous copy. So I My know. very last question is about, uh, uh, regarding the illiquis and the, the oral anticoagulation, because we know that these drugs don't, don't work very well, for example, in cases like antiphospholipid syndrome. And uh, the mechanism of, uh, of coagulation in, in, in COVID could be some, in, in a way related to this. So do, do you suggest to give heparin or oral anticoagulation in case you, you add it to your protocol? Uh, to me, I mean, what we're doing, we are doing the uh, low molecular weight heparin for as a DVT prophylaxis or, or VTE prophylaxis. So the... Uh, thank, you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we don't use the... Oh. Is there any questions? No, thank you very much. You know, it was very, I think, very important. I think, yeah. I think it, the, we are waiting the, the hope of uh, Ramadan <laughs> and finishing COVID-19. Oh, so, Allah, it's a prayer. 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 والخبرة العميقة الدكتور أحمد حلاوة طبعا معنا دايما بقلبه وخبرته بشكره على السبورت وعلى مراجعته للريفيو أرتكلز in a very short time الدكتور حسين فشاوي بالدسكشنز العميقة والمجهود اللي عمله طبعا الدكتور محمد صلاح والدكتور حسين فشاوي والدكتور هشام السيد في إعداد التوصيات لوزارة الصحة المصرية وطبعا مع الجامعات المصرية وإحنا كلنا طبعا نتمنى نتمنى أيا كان بقى اللي, اللي شغال في الجايد لاينز ولا الكلام ده نتمنى ان هذا الفيروس يختفي و و و و وما وما يطولش اكتر من كده من المصريين يعني وتبقى نهايته وتبقى نهايته نهايه مباركه لرمضان وكل سنه وانتم طيبين ونلتقي دايما جميعا على كل خير وصحه وسعاده يا رب مع الف سلامه شكرا جزيلا شكرا 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 مع الف سلامه مع السلامه